In this video, we'll look at some properties of definite integrals. Because definite integrals are defined in terms of Riemann sums, the proofs of many of these properties require us to use Riemann sums. However, we can understand what the properties are telling us using geometric intuition. Here's a function, f of x, and we're integrating it from a to b. If we were to let b equal a, then the interval over which we're integrating would be non-existent. That distance would be zero. So all of the delta x's in our Riemann sum would be zero, and the limit of those Riemann sums would also be zero. Now, technically, the definition of a Riemann sum requires the delta x's to be positive, so we actually have to take this as an axiom, just a definition, uh, when we're integrating from a to a. But anytime we integrate a bounded function over a single point, the answer is going to be zero. For example, if someone asks you to find the value of this definite integral, because we're integrating from five to five, the answer must be zero, regardless of what function we have here as the integrand. Our next property concerns what happens when we reverse the endpoints of integration. If we integrate from a to b, and b is bigger than a, we're accumulating area as we move along underneath the curve. But if b were to be less than a, then we'd be moving in the backwards direction, and those delta x's in our Riemann sum would be negative. The definition of a Riemann sum requires those delta x's to all be positive. So we take this property here as another definition or axiom. So if we know that the integral from 3 to 6 of some function f of x dx equals 12, then if we reverse that order of integration, if we go from 6 back to 3, the answer must be negative 12. Our next property tells us what happens when we multiply a function by a constant. When we multiply a function by a constant, graphically, the graph of the new function gets scaled by a certain amount. For example, if we set our scale factor to 1 half, each value of the function 1 half f of x is exactly half as tall as the value f of x. So the area underneath this scaled version of the graph is going to be half of the area under the original graph. Another way of thinking about this is that we can factor that scale factor outside of the integral. So for example, if we know the integral from 2 to 4 of g of x equals 7, then the integral from 2 to 4 of 3 times g of x dx I forgot the dx up here, must be 3 times the integral from 2 to 4 of g of x dx, which is 3 times 7, which is 21. For our next property, let's look at a third point, c. This property says that the integral from a to b of a function plus the integral from b to c of that same function is the same thing as the integral from a to c. Geometrically, that's just adding this greenish area to this purplish area. This property also works if b, say, is over here. If we take the integral from a to b, we're actually subtracting this red area. Then we add the integral from b to c, which is the red area plus the purple area. So if we take that total integral minus the red area, we get just the purple area which is the integral from a to c. In fact, this property works regardless of the order of a, b, and c. Here are three more properties of definite integrals. In the first one, it says the integral of a sum is equal to the sum of the integrals. We can visualize this for some simple functions. The integral of f of x is the area of this reddish triangle. The integral of g of x from a to b is the area of this bluish rectangle. And if we take f of x plus g of x, we take each f of x value and add on the corresponding g of x value, and we get the area of this trapezoid, which would be the area of the triangle plus the area of the rectangle. For the second property, this says the integral 
of a difference is the difference of those integrals. So for example, if f is the top function here and g is the bottom function, the blue one, then the integral of f minus g would be the integral of f, which is the trapezoid, minus the integral of g, that gives us the area of the rectangle, and that's going to give us the area in between here. Finally, if the red function is f and the blue function is g, and f is less than or equal to g everywhere in our interval, then the integral of f is going to be less than or equal to the integral of g, which we can see here that the integral of the triangle is less than or equal to the area of the rectangle. A special case of this last property comes up when we have a lower bound and an upper bound for a function. Here's the graph of a function. We're integrating this function f of x between a and b. If we know the minimum value of the function on that interval, then we can construct a one rectangle Riemann sum for this function, and the area of that rectangle will be that minimum value of the function, little m, times the length of the interval, b minus a. And so that rectangle area must be less than or equal to the value of the integral, the green area. If instead we look at this maximum value of the function on the interval, then we create another rectangle that has height capital M and length b minus a. And so the green area, the value of this definite integral, must be less than or equal to that maximum value times the length of the interval. We can use this property to create a lower bound and an upper bound for the value of an integral and use this as a check to see if the value we compute of this definite integral, once we learn how to do so in general, is a reasonable value. Let's now define a function in terms of an integral. I'm going to integrate this simple function f of x equals 3 from a up to not b but some changing value x. So I will define an area function or an accumulation function as a of x equals the integral from little a to x of f of t dt. It doesn't matter what I call this uh, variable here. Sometimes it's called a dummy variable of an integral. It's the variable of integration. I could call it u or y or something else, but I'm going to use t. I just can't use x because I'm using x for my upper endpoint of integration up there. We can visualize this area function or accumulation function as being the area of this rectangle when our right endpoint is at position x. For this special simple function f of x equals 3, it's not difficult to find a formula for this capital A of x. For any value of x, the area function will simply equal the area of this rectangle which will be 3 times x minus a. This area value is changing as x changes, and we might want to know the rate at which it's changing. To find that rate, we could take the derivative of our area function, and the derivative of 3x minus 3a, a being a constant, would be 3. Notice that the derivative of our area function is the function that we're using as the integrand in our integral to begin with. This could be coincidence, but let's try another example and see what happens. Let's now look at the function x, f of x equals x. Now my area for any value x is going to be the area of this trapezoid. Here, our area function will be the integral from little a up to x of the function, well, I called it x, but here I'm going to use t dt. I'm using t as my variable of integration. And because this is a trapezoid, I can take the base, which would be x minus a, times the average of the heights. On this side, when I plug in a into the function y equals t, I get out a. Here, when I plug x into my function y equals t, I get out x. I could rewrite this 
as x minus a times x plus a all over 2. And I could also write this as x squared minus ax plus ax minus a squared over 2. Or I could write this as 1 half x squared minus 1 half a squared. This is my area function. Notice if I take the derivative of this area function to find out the rate at which we're accumulating area, we get back x, which again was the original function that we were integrating. Again, this could be coincidence, but we might now start to ask ourselves, is there a relationship between the derivative of our area function, the derivative of this integral function, and the integrand? Do we always get this back? In other words, if I let a of x equal the integral from 3 to x of t squared dt, does that mean that a prime of x equals x squared? If it does, we might be able to ask ourselves what functions capital A of x would have a derivative x squared and use this to evaluate such integrals. We'll get to that soon. Finally, we might ask ourselves which functions actually are integrable? Which functions have limits of Riemann sums that converge to some value? This function, which we have called our holy function, because it has a lot of holes in it, is a special function that we define to be 2 if we plug in a rational number. So for example, if I plug 37 fourteenths into my function, I get out 2. If I plug in an irrational number, like pi over 2, then I get out 1. This function is not integrable because any lower sum for this will always be 1 times the length of the interval, b minus a. All of the lower rectangles will have a height of 1 because on any interval, despite the way this actually looks here on the screen, any interval has infinitely many irrational numbers and rational numbers in it. So no matter how small I take my, my delta x interval here, it's going to have a 2 as an output and a 1 as an output somewhere in that interval. All of my upper sums will be 2 times the length of the interval, and so the, the upper Riemann sums will always be 2 times b minus a, the lower sums will always be 1 times b minus a, those don't get closer to each other no matter how fine of a partition I take, and therefore this function will not be integrable. So which functions are integrable? We can show that continuous functions are integrable. In fact, piecewise continuous functions, where we have a finite number of pieces, are integrable. And there are even other functions besides those that are integrable, but there are certainly ones that are not, including this holy function.